The Majority Leader. I ask consent that further proceedings on the quorum call be dispensed with. Without objection. This weekend saw a brazen attack by Iran on a critical oil facility in Saudi Arabia. This is not just an isolated drone strike with the prospect of regional escalation, but an attack with significant repercussions for the entire global energy market. We're fortunate that advances in U.S. oil and gas production have made the U.S. more energy independent and added capacity to global markets. But the impact of this attack could still be substantial. For this reason, I welcome the administration's preparations to potentially release oil from the strategic petroleum reserves, if needed, to stabilize global markets. I hope our international partners will join us in imposing consequences on Tehran for this reckless, destabilizing attack. Now, in another matter, when the Senate returned last week, we anticipated our top priority would be conducting the appropriations process and avoiding a lapse in government funding. We had a clear roadmap, a bipartisan, bicameral agreement negotiated by the President's team and the Speaker of the House. It set top-line funding targets for both defense and non-defense and laid out ground rules to protect the process from partisan politics. So there's actually been reason for optimism. This week, we hope to move to the House passed bills for defense, energy and water, labor age, and state and foreign ops. This would be our first procedural step to get the process moving for all of our priorities on both sides. There's nothing controversial about this particular grouping of bills. In fact, it was Speaker Pelosi who combined this grouping of bills to move first over in the House. And furthermore, Mr. President, if any of the funding measures was going to be handled earnestly across party lines, surely it ought to be the bill funding the Department of Defense. Our fundamental obligation is to provide for the common defense of our country. All members feel our responsibility to keep the nation safe. And fortunately, the CAPS agreement specifically allows us to increase defense funding to meet the growing threats our nation faces. And yet, and yet, Mr. President, here's where we are. <clears throat> One weekend, our Democratic colleagues tried to stone to even filibuster a motion to begin considering the House pass defense funding bill later this week. There's only one way to read this. Some of our Democratic colleagues have determined they would rather stage a political fight with President Trump <coughs> than secure the resources that our uniformed commanders urge is taking a back seat to partisan politics. So let's be absolutely clear about the concerns and priorities that our Democratic friends are deprioritizing. <clears throat> the defense spending measure would bolster efforts to modernize our forces and build the U.S. military of the future. Russia is actively modernizing its own forces, just as we've seen the Putin regime step up its brazen attempts to exert destabilizing influence well beyond its borders. In China, the last decade has seen military spending nearly double, double. <coughs> our regional partners continue to feel the tightening grip of the Chinese Communist Party on trade and strategic activity, while the technological ripples of Chinese cyber meddling are felt right here at home. In the face of surging great power adversaries, simple upkeep is not enough to keep America and our allies safe from aggression. Comprehensive funding for research, development, and readiness programs <coughs> is what's needed. In Afghanistan, Syria, Somalia, Yemen, and beyond, we continue to face sustained threats from terrorist organizations. And in the Middle East, we've seen how Iran's bid for regional hegemony and its investments in terror missiles 
and partners, key shipping lines, and global energy markets. So this bipartisan defense bill would help us adapt to meet these new threats while ensuring our commanders can prosecute existing operations without being consumed by the instability of short-term continuing resolutions. But our Democratic colleagues would rather provoke a partisan feud with the president, rather have a fight with the president than stick to the agreement that we all made. At least that's where we are as of the moment. I remain hopeful that my friends on the Democratic side will join us in honoring the terms of the agreement struck by the president and the speaker and help us reboot a bipartisan funding process. The readiness and modernization of America's military and the safety of the American people should not play second fiddle to our Democratic colleagues' political strategy. Now, on a completely different matter, for anybody who's been reading the news the past few days, it's probably felt a little like Groundhog Day. Because over the last couple of days, leading Democrats have tried to grab on to yet another poorly sourced, thinly reported, unsubstantiated allegation against Justice Brett Kavanaugh. There they go again, Mr. President. There they go again. Called it a one-year anniversary reenactment. Senate Democrats reopening the sad and embarrassing chapter they wrote last September. The latest allegation was blasted out by a major newspaper despite the apparent lack of any, any corroborating evidence whatsoever. The reporting was so thin, the story ran not in the news section, but on the opinion page. In fact, Mr. President, they've already had to issue an enormous correction. The writers conveniently failed to note that the supposed victim herself declined to be interviewed. And several of her friends say she has no memory of any such thing happening. We all remember this pattern from last time around. Shoot first, correct the facts later. And here's another familiar pattern, just like last September. Little things like facts and evidence didn't stop Democrats from rushing to exploit this. <coughs> Even as the media was trying to backpedal, a number of the Democratic presidential candidates were hysterically calling for Justice Kavanaugh to be impeached. On the basis of this flimsy, uncorroborated story, they're calling for Justice Kavanaugh to be impeached. That includes several of our own Senate colleagues. And either after, even after the massive correction, correction, no one in that group has backed off of the ridiculous threat. This laughable suggestion is already earning scorn throughout the country across the political spectrum. A majority of senators and the American people rightly rejected the politics of unsubstantiated personal destruction just last year. It's just as transparent and self-serving today, one year later. But it would be a mistake to dismiss this as a bad case of sour grapes. This is not just a left-wing obsession with one man. It's part of a deliberate effort to attack judicial independence. Six of the Democratic presidential candidates, plus one who has now quit to run for the Senate, have publicly flirted with packing the Supreme Court. Court packing, court packing. Today's bold new Democratic idea, a failed power grab from back in the 1930s. Just a few weeks ago, some senators our colleagues sent the court an outlandish brief, gravely intoning that the Supreme Court is not well, they said. The Supreme Court is not well. 
Here was the punchline. Either issue rulings we like or we'll pack the court. Issue rulings that we like or we'll pack the court. This is not normal political behavior. These are the actions of a political party whose agenda is so alien to the Constitution that they feel threatened by fair and faithful judges. Well, Mr. President, this is what I would say. When the simple notion that judges should be faithful to the Constitution looks like an attack on your agenda, maybe it's your agenda that needs a makeover, not our independent judiciary. When you are this willing to launch unhinged personal attacks, you reveal a whole lot more about your own radicalism than about the men and women you target. So this is my commitment, Mr. President, and the commitment of all my Republican colleagues. As long as we remain in the Senate, we will fight to preserve our fair and independent judiciary.